everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks to everyone for joining today. Um, I, uh, I am happy to welcome you to this webinar. If you're having trouble hearing at any point, uh, please just indicate in the, the Q&A or the chat feature through WebEx. Uh, you'll be, you should be able to type there and we'll receive those, those comments as they come in. Uh, my name is Sarah McKelvey. I am the Knowledge and Governance Officer of the Municipal Asset Management Program. The program is offered by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and is funded by the Government of Canada. So I'll take a brief moment to highlight a few of the features in the WebEx platform we're using um, and just go over the structure of the webinar. We have four panelists on the line who are eager to discuss various topics related to getting started with asset management and we encourage you to ask questions. We welcome your questions through, as I mentioned, the Q&A feature in WebEx, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. If it doesn't show up, there should be um, a, a panel of, of options at the bottom of your screen with three dots, and you can click on that and click on Q&A. Um, please direct your questions to the panelists and host, and uh, we'll answer them as best we can as, at a suitable time following all four of the presentations. Uh, if you have any questions or clar of clarification that arise during a particular presentation, uh, please feel free to send them uh, to us at any point and we'll try to answer it before moving on. I will note uh, also that three of the four presentations will be offered in English and there will be one guest speaker uh, presenting in French. Please refer to the presentation material that was sent uh, earlier today by email if you'd like to follow along in French. You might find yourself here if you're just starting out in asset management and are looking for some guidance on how to get going. We understand the value of peer learning and providing space for municipalities at various stages in asset management to learn from each other. No one person is doing asset management alone, and so we're pleased to offer this mechanism to provide examples of others who have been where you are. We hope that you will walk away with some key steps you can take to get started in asset management and will have learned from some of the opportunities and lessons of your peers. I'll start by briefly introducing the Building Blocks of Asset Management Guide to you uh, in case you're not familiar with it. The Building Blocks of Asset Management Guide was developed to lay out specific ways that municipalities can reach level one of FCM's asset management readiness scale. The Asset Management Readiness Scale is a self-assessment tool that FCM developed to help municipalities assess their community's current asset management practices and formalize asset management activities into documented business practices. The Building Blocks of Asset Management Guide walks you through steps you can take to achieve level one of, asset, of the Asset Management Readiness Scale in five different competency areas, which include policy and governance, people and leadership, data and information, planning and decision making, and contribution to asset management practice. The guide showcases 10 different municipalities across Canada who took concrete steps towards reaching level one in various competency areas. And we're very fortunate to have four of those municipalities represented here today to share with us the steps they took to individually reach level one in three different competency areas. George Toporowski is the mayor of the town of Shelbrook, Saskatchewan, and will be speaking about his experience reaching level one of the planning and decision-making uh, planning and decision-making competency. Dominique Doucette is chief administrative officer of the municipality of saint ferdinand Quebec. Dominique was with the city of Plessyville, Quebec, when they reached level one of the policy and governance competency. Randy Losey is the administrator of the village of Shelburne. Village of Lorburn, excuse me, Saskatchewan, and will be sharing her experience reaching level one of the data and information competency. Michael Riseborough is the former mayor and chief administrative officer of the village of Haynes Junction, Yukon, and will also be sharing his experience reaching level one of the data and information competency. So without further ado, I will hand it over to George Tomperez about his experience with the planning and decision-making competency. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, uh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Just a little bit of history about about the town of Shelbrook. Uh, uh, we're uh, our census population is about uh, or is uh, 
1,444. Uh, we have a couple of fairly large First Nations communities relatively close to us, so catchment area for for us is probably in that eight to 10,000 uh, folks range. We're located about 45 kilometers west of the city of Prince Albert and about 140 kilometers north of the city of Saskatoon. We're pre predominantly an agricultural area, we're, uh, and uh, we do have all major amenities in our community, including schools, uh, uh, medical, uh, including hospital and, and dental, uh, recreational, and, uh, and a quite a vibrant business community. Next, please, Sarah. <clears throat> why, why did we get started in asset management? Uh, we needed a, a proactive sift, system pardon me, that provided some factual information for council and staff to make informed decisions. Prior to getting started, we, we really didn't have any inventory. We didn't have any condition data. We uh, uh, weren't familiar and didn't use life cycle costing. We had no defined uh, written down level of service and we had no formal risk assessment. Next, please. So what we did, uh, 2010 or 11, uh, we attended a three-day training seminar uh, and there was a couple of folks from, from our office staff, our public works supervisor and myself who attended a, an AM session in, in Saskatoon. Council training uh, and that buy-in is, is really, really important and following our, our training sessions, we had uh, a council session uh, that explained the basic concepts of, of, of asset management using very simple examples like your house and your vehicle and, and how timely maintenance extended the life. So uh, with those, it was, uh, it was quite easy to uh, to engage our council because they could see the benefits. Uh, um, we, <clears throat> we 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 in initially intended to uh, to do the work in house, but it, as with many small municipalities, you find that uh, your staff is at or, or slightly over capacity. So to get uh, to move forward, we engaged a, a consultant, and I would describe that as a typical. Uh, non or a non typical uh, relationship. Uh, our consultant did the legwork for us and facilitated any of the decision making sessions, but council and staff had to make the decisions about things like uh, level of service, risk, all of those kinds of, of uh, 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 decision points. We, uh, in order to get the condition data, and, and you can spend a lot of time uh, doing this at pretty heavy cost, but for us, what, what worked well was uh, we sat down with our public work staff who are familiar with our systems, and we went through and ranked uh, uh, the, the uh, segments on a good, fair, uh, poor basis uh, using their knowledge of the systems. Over the next number of years, we developed asset management plans for all of our major assets, and and in 2017, I think we we developed the last one uh, of the the actual plans. Our approach: uh, we started with the asset management plans, and we've just uh, in the last year developed some policies around and, and adopted those policies. Next, please. <coughs> What are some of the results? Uh, we have an actual usable asset inventory. We actually have written down uh, defined levels of service for the various uh, uh, assets that we have. Uh, we have a recorded risk assessment. Uh, um, and, and based on uh, the information we obtained from the, from the reports, we, we actually have improved our management practices and we certainly have improved our budgeting strategies and we use that information a lot and we're, we're headed toward uh, some long-term financial planning. Next, please. <clears throat> Level one outcomes achieved, uh, documentation and standardization. Uh, approaches uh, uh, for asset management are in place 
but at present we're probably not consistent with uh, with uh, how we do it. Asset management plans, as I stated, we have asset management plans for all of our uh, our major assets. And budgeting fin financial plans, we use uh, we we certainly use those plans in the in the budgeting process. So moving forward. What we'd like to do is, is refine and document our asset management strategy. We need to develop some in-house expertise to ensure longevity of, the, of the, the program. And we're continuing to move towards long-term financial planning. Next, please. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it moving and uh, move on to our next presenter, Dominique Doucette, um, about uh, reaching level one in the policy and governance competency. À vous, Monsieur Doucette. <laughs> Merci, Sarah. Hi, welcome. I will, do, I will be doing my presentation in French. If you have any question, I will send uh, my email uh, via WebEx. Uh, and you can contact me in, uh, in English by email or call me, and I will you, I will be pleased to answer your question. Bon, uh, maintenant pour la ville de Plessisville, uh, j'ai été pendant deux ans, uh, près de trois ans, chargé de projet à la direction générale à la ville de Plessisville. Uh, next slide, please. Ça. Uh, C'est une ville de 6700 habitants sur un territoire de 4,4 km carrés. Comme vous pouvez constater, 6700 habitants sur 4,4 km carrés, ça fait un, une ville assez dense, en milieu rural tout de même, mais une ville assez dense, euh, où est-ce que le territoire est fortement urbanisé, on a près de 100 de développement de la municipalité, et il reste presque plus de terrain libre. Euh, C'est une économie qui est basée sur euh, le secteur manufacturier et de services. Next slide, Sarah. Merci. Euh, je travaille actuellement à la municipalité de Saint-Ferdinand, pour laquelle on, on entreprend en 2019 une démarche de gestion des actifs. Notre démarche que je vais vous rencontrer, que je vais vous parler dans les prochaines slides, euh, seront, euh, ont, eu lieu, ont été faites, ont été réalisées à la ville de Plessville. Saint-Ferdinand, c'est une petite municipalité, 2000, 2000 habitants. Euh, la, toutefois, en été, la population s'accroît à 25-30 de plus de citoyens sur un territoire de 137 km. Bien que ce soit un milieu fortement rural, il y a les trois réseaux qu'on y retrouve. On en retrouve donc le réseau d'aqueduc, le réseau d'égout, le réseau pluvial. C'est une économie basée sur la villégiature et l'agriculture. Next slide. La motivation à la ville de Plessville, puis aussi à la municipalité de Saint-Ferdinand pour entreprendre une telle démarche de gestion des actifs. Euh, au niveau stratégique, les élus, les directeurs généraux, si on parle des élus, leurs besoins, leurs motivations, c'est plutôt clair. Ils s'en rendent peut-être pas compte, mais ils sont constamment, ben, ils s'en rendent compte plutôt, mais ils sont constamment en train de prendre des décisions sans connaître quels sont les défis à long terme. Euh, ou bien des fois ils les méconnaissent, ou des fois ils ne sont pas certains de savoir quels sont nos défis, quels sont nos enjeux à long terme, c'est quoi la viabilité financière de notre municipalité à moyen terme, à court terme, ils peuvent le voir, ils savent, ils connaissent le budget de fonctionnement, ils connaissent le niveau d'endettement, mais si on réalise tous les projets qu'on retrouve dans notre plan d'action, où est-ce qu'elle situe notre viabilité financière à moyen et à long terme? Donc, il y a un besoin d'arrimer euh, une gestion des actifs avec, la, avec euh, le plan stratégique de la municipalité. Et d'ailleurs, il, euh, il y a aussi un besoin de soutenir la prise de décision éclairée en mesurant les impacts financiers et environnementaux à long terme. Pour la direction générale, le besoin, la motivation est assez est tout, tout, tout simple. Est, ça nous permet, une gestion des actifs nous permet d'accroître notre rôle de bon conseiller auprès du conseil en fournissant de l'information qui est, premièrement, qui est synthétique et qui vise aussi une perspective de long terme. Euh, au niveau de la tactique, puis c'est tout, tout aussi important au niveau de la, de, des gestionnaires, euh, les gestionnaires, bien sûr, ils vont s'en rendre compte, ils manquent l'information, ils manquent de collaboration avec les autres départements. Euh, c'est pas c'est pas c'est pas une mauvaise volonté c'est involontaire on est pris dans le quotidien on est en mode réactif et on a besoin d'amener donc une motivation il y a un besoin d'amener une plus grande collaboration avec les divers départements de la municipalité ou de la ville et au niveau opérationnel vous le savez sûrement tout aussi bien que moi euh, les travailleurs sur le terrain ont l'impression de ne pas être écoutés ils ont ils ont l'impression que leur opinion ne prend n'a pas d'impact sur les décisions donc une démarche de gestion des actifs vient cadrer tous les efforts de gestion de nos infrastructures, de la base au plus haut niveau, dans une même démarche. Et donc, euh, je crois que ça répond à beaucoup de besoins à, à tous les niveaux de l'organisation. Next slide, please. 
Donc, euh, les... qu'est-ce qui a été fait à la ville de Plessville? Euh, dans un premier temps, nous avons élaboré, adopté une politique de gestion des actifs, une stratégie de gestion des actifs. Euh, L'élaboration, elle est très importante. Ça doit être le fruit d'un travail d'équipe. On ne la fait pas avec un consultant tout seul, le directeur général, avec un consultant. Non, on prend les personnes pertinente dans l'organisation, puis on les fait travailler ensemble à l'aide d'un facilitateur. Et là, on réalise la politique de gestion des actifs. À la Ville de Plessis, on avait aussi formé un comité de gestion des actifs. C'est le comité qui supervise l'application de la politique. Et sur ce comité-là, il y a un élu. Un élu, vous trouvez l'élu qui est le plus, qui, comprend, qui réussit à comprendre bien les enjeux de gestion des actifs. Et il devient votre porte-parole au sein du conseil. Et c'est lui qui va toujours à la préoccupation, lorsqu'il y a un nouveau projet qui est présenté, de questionner le, les, euh, les promoteurs de projets en fonction de la gestion des actifs. Nous avions aussi implanté un logiciel de gestion des actifs au sein des différents départements. Je reviendrai rapidement tantôt. Et finalement, on n'a on pas le choix. Quand on travaille ensemble à faire une politique de gestion des actifs, on, sensibilise, on se sensibilise nous-mêmes à la gestion des actifs et en même temps, on forme nos employés et les élus en gestion des actifs. Next slide, please. Impact. Euh, ce qui, ce qui, quels sont les... Euh, euh, les résultats, ça a été euh, euh, engagement des élus dans une gestion durable des actifs. Il y avait un élu qui était porteur du dossier puis qui en a fait sa priorité. Je me souviens très bien à la ville de Plessville, l'élu posait des questions. Est-ce qu'il avait un projet? Il se demandait toujours quel impact financier à long terme, est-ce qu'on est, est, qu est capable avec nos, avec nos ressources humaines actuellement de gérer cet actif-là. Euh, meilleure confiance des élus. Les élus ont une plus grande confiance dans leurs décisions. Ils voient plus clairement les impacts futurs. Ils peuvent mieux les expliquer, leurs décisions aussi. Euh, donc, je, je crois puis je, je le ressens très bien quand je parle avec les élus qui sont plus confiants dans leurs décisions. Pour les gestionnaires, la prise de décision en investissement est plus transparente. Il y a moins de jeux politiques. Euh, ça rassure, je pense que ça, ça les rassure quand on fait qu'ils ont moins besoin d'user de, stratég de stratégèmes politiques pour arriver à leur fin. Euh, Très rapidement, moi, je me suis aperçu qu'il y avait un vocabulaire et une perspective de gestion des actifs qui était utilisée plus couramment par les gestionnaires et où finalement, les employés sont aussi mieux informés des projets de la municipalité et sont plus mobilisés. Next slide, please. Et les leçons apprises. Euh, ce que je pourrais dire pour n'importe quelle municipalité, commencer. Commencer par la base, c'est pas compliqué. Faites une politique de gestion des actifs, essayez de la faire en commun. Euh, faites une stratégie aussi de la, de la gestion des actifs, faites-la en commun avec l'aide d'un facilitateur. C'est extrêmement payant pour une activité finalement qui ne prend pas beaucoup de temps et qui ne coûte pas très cher. Pas besoin d'installer de logiciel ou autre. Euh, vous installerez ça au bon moment, mais pour l'instant, si vous n'avez rien fait, commencez par ça. Puis, à mon avis, ça va, euh, les fruits, vous allez les voir rapidement. Puis, euh, à l'aide d'un bon facilitateur, préparez ces documents avec l'ensemble du personnel. Je me répète, mais euh, je rappelle juste que ce n'est pas nécessaire d'avoir un consultant qui fait tout, mais d'avoir quelqu'un qui vous aide à accoucher d'une politique. Donc, uh, is it all for me, uh, Sarah? Excellent. Merci beaucoup, Dominique. Un grand merci à vous. Um, so we'll, uh, moving forward, we'll shift gears a little bit uh, to hear about data and information. Randy Lothi will uh, start us off with one of uh, the first of two presentations about reaching level one of the data and information competency. Hi, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> so, thank you everybody for attending. So, my name is Brandy Losey and I'm the administrator for the Village of Floraburn. Next slide, please. So, for us, for getting started, uh, the main catalyst for beginning the asset management process was our district planning commission. Uh, we belong to Waterwolf Planning. There are uh, 33 communities in our planning district and this project involved 13 of them. Our uh, Planning Commission hired Urban Systems to provide asset management training in the fall of 2016. The following two slides show the brochure that was developed by Urban Systems to communicate to the rest of the planning district the work that we were undertaking. Thanks, Sarah. Next, please. All right, so steps to achieve level one. Focusing on data and information, the Village of Lorburn was able to achieve FCM's Level 1 on the readiness scale that Sarah showed at the beginning as well and is also found on the website by completing the following tasks. We used our existing tangible capital asset register to compile inventory and financial data. We did this for all of Lorburn's asset categories, roads, water, sewer, buildings, equipment, and land. Next, please. So for data and information, uh, data can be gathered from many sources and in many ways. 
Uh, the picture that you see there is an overview of Lorburn. So we are quite small. We have 106 people, and we're about 120 kilometers southwest of Saskatoon, to give you an idea of where we are. Um, we did go look at maps. We physically drove around our village. We took pictures. We got out the measuring tape, and we talked to the council and foreman. And then we did compile all that information and put it into Excel spreadsheets. Next, please. So the benefits of asset management. Obviously, compliance with federal gas tax funding requirements. Capital and operating budget planning. So with our asset management plan, we know now when an infrastructure needs to be replaced and the cost to replace it. And having this information on hand will make your budget planning decisions much more accurate. Uh, proactive rather than reactive. So being reactive in relation to infrastructure costs or infrastructure repairs can be costly. So now we are doing preventative maintenance and we're even saving money. Um, eliminating the certainty of lost organizational knowledge. This, uh, we've noticed, and I'm sure several have, that due to staff change and council change over the years, this is pretty tough to, to combat. So this planning ahead makes quite a difference. Council engagement. For us, it was really beneficial to have our councillors involved. They can see how the plan came about and where the inf information comes from and how useful it can be. And then finally, creating new opportunities. So we were work worked together with 13 other communities, and for us that was, that was really great, and we really look forward to doing that again. Next, please. So lessons learned. What worked well? Involving council, engaging community, and working regionally. And then what could be changed? I don't think that I would change the way that we accomplished the work. It was a lot of work. It was overwhelming in the beginning. And we could have done a few more workshops, and maybe it would have taken longer. But, you know, if it takes longer, then that's not going to help us, right? So what matters most is that you just start. Next, please. And the last slide just shows our contact information. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brandy. Very insightful. And uh, moving on to our uh, our last presentation for my guest speaker, Michael Risebro will be expanding on the uh, on level one of the data and information competency area. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I won't be speaking to every slide specifically, and do not enjoy the luxury of having been connected with you all over the internet. But as Sarah says, my name is Michael Risebro, and I'm a former CAO and former Mayor of Haynes Junction in Yukon. We embarked on our asset management journey some five years ago now. Next slide, please, Sarah. Gathering the raw data you will require to build your asset management, uh, your asset ledger or asset register will be one of the most time-consuming exercises you will engage in. As a municipality, Haynes Junction is about 30 years young and historically, the Yukon Territorial Government assumed the responsibility for infrastructure development throughout the Territory. This was definitely to our advantage because it restricted the number of repositories in which asset management information, costs, and acquisition dates were stored to municipal records, government records, or the territorial archives. So despite the relative ease with which we were able to gather our data, it was an incredibly time-consuming process, and our treasurer spent some four months of dedicated time to track down the data on our 300 or so tangible capital assets. Slide, please, Sarah. I'm at odds with many of my associates in the world of asset management because I approach an analysis of the asset base through the lens of a systems analyst and a computer programmer. I view asset management uh, plan as a plan based on and derived from raw data. And as such, I consider it just another very important, but still just another management information system. You, as the owner or custodian of your community's assets, are in the best place of anyone to determine what information you need to make informed decisions. Ask yourself what you want to get out of an asset management plan or system and look around at who offers what, then cherry pick the reports you want. Next slide, please, Sarah. All management information systems have just uh, or have a great deal in common. 
They are comprised of just three basic elements. Uh, slide, please, Sarah. The inputs, the processes, and the outputs. So before you even start thinking about inputs or systems or programs, satisfy yourself that you've identified all of the answers or reports. In other words, the outputs that you want your system to provide to you. It's only through identifying the outputs that you can determine the inputs you need to capture and the processes that will, you will have to adopt to provide you with the required answers. There is both a data and information, uh, sorry, there's both data and information relevant to the financial staff and to the technical staff. Their respective needs are different, hence the importance of establishing a multidisciplinary team. At this point, some of you may be thinking, what's he babbling about? Inputs, processes, and outputs, and that's a fair question, and worthy of a simple example to clarify the terms. Let's say that you have a truck that you bought three years ago, and your experience is that a truck in your municipality lasts eight years. When do you have to replace it? What we do know is this is 2019. We bought the truck three years ago in 2016. It's estimated useful life is eight years. The known data here are the inputs. What, we, what can we calculate from the known data? 2019 today minus 2016, the year of acquisition, is three. The truck's three years old. We know that. It's expected to last eight years. 2016 plus eight is 2024. Um, it, and it should have a remaining useful life of eight minus three or five years. The calculations showing the truck's age and scheduled replacement date are the processes. And the replacement year 2024 is the output. While it's way beyond the scope of this short presentation, suffice it to say that those few pieces of information enabled you to derive an awful lot. Sorry, Sarah, we should be on my slide six. By way of an expanded example, the system we developed in Haines Junction takes the following five simple pieces of information, and from those few pieces, augmented with financial information, is capable of producing well over a dozen reports. And I do differentiate here between the variable or dynamic data specific to a specific or to a single asset and static data applicable to multiple assets as information. From a unique asset description, sorry, slide, uh, with an asset codified into a documented classification system, which is science's estimated useful life, and we use the uh, Alberta system here, the original purchase price or fair market value for donated assets, and the year of acquisition, one may calculate variables used in other calculations to, to produce reports that detail the outputs on slide seven and more. Uh, there's over a dozen there, I, I, I recall. Data and information elements identified with the uh, superscripted P flag potential policy considerations for you. If there's a P that appears there, think about the requirement for policy. And those uh, superscripted with an A flag the potential advantage of soliciting your auditor's advice. Those with a U are ones that we have planned for Hinge Junction but are not currently uh, implemented. Uh, slide eight, please. Due to the size of our community, we have not developed the technical side of the asset management system to the same degree as the financial side. Slide, please. At this stage in our growth, our current and growth system capacities are so small as to be known in the absence of engineering studies. Uh, slide 10 is not really original material. There have to be benefits flowing from any management information system, otherwise why have it? A benefit which I have not included in the slide, and it's been spoken to by all of the other speakers, is that of financial asset management. The information which can be derived from the simple financial inputs above can be used to inform and optimize your strategic investment decisions for returns on investment and deposit terms for monies allocated to reserve accounts. Last slide, please. 
recognize that asset man the that the asset management cycle is precisely that it's a cycle it never ends but repeats iterations and it self improves every time it goes through that loop thank you very much thank you so much michael for that uh, in depth discussion um and uh, and presentation of your experience and, and how you how you went about the data and information side of things. Um, I'm going to uh, I'll now welcome all of the participants to pose any questions that you have for the panel. Uh, we'll try to get to all of the questions. However, if any are missed, I welcome you to reach out to myself for any follow up. And if you'd like to direct a question to a specific panelist, please just indicate so in your questions through the Q and A feature in WebEx. Um, and uh, I noticed Stephanie had a, a question for Dominic. And Dominic, if you're still on the line, uh, maybe we could just address it to everyone on the phone. Stephanie asks, what kind of facilitator was hired to help facilitate this process? Uh, whether it was a, an adult educator type of general facilitator, um, or en dragog, or a, a technical expert on asset management. Yes. Uh, it was a technical expert on asset management. It was, uh, we met Catherine Dallar from CopyMG, and we really uh, like his, his approach to asset management. So we, we gave her a contract, and it was really, it was a, it was a really nice thing to work with her on our, on our asset management policy. Excellent. Thank you. I wonder if any of the other panelists have any comments on on the types of um, uh, facilitators that they got or, or or assistance to facilitate the processes. Sure. This is George. Uh, we engaged a firm called Atana Management, who it, it was a small uh, uh, small firm. Uh, principal is Dr. Gordon Sparks, who some of you may know has been a proponent of asset management for a long, long time. Uh, working with his his company was uh, it, it just worked extremely well for us. They, they had a couple of uh, employees there, Nicole Allen and uh, another gentleman by the name of Darian Brown, that are uh, were very well versed in the, in the software. And that basically was their their role. They they looked after the software component of it uh, and then facilit out of that facilitated the decision making things for for council and staff. I wonder if uh, Michael or Brandy if you have anything to add on to that sort of that topic. Brandy, did you have any? Uh, no, no, I had just mentioned that we had used Urban Systems and they were incredibly helpful. They really were. The only additional comment I would make is that uh, one of the people that FCM has used and we did use in the community of Haynes Junction was Christina Bentley. Mm -hmm. And Christina is a very good um, person to explain some of the origins behind asset management and some of the benefits from it. That's a fair point for sure. And it might be a good segue into um, the value of, of partnerships, not necessarily just with consultants, but with other municipalities and uh, organizations in your area or across the country that you use to support um, support advancing in asset management. Brandy, I know I, you work with a, a, in a sort of a coalition or a collaboration with a number of other municipalities. Um, maybe you could speak to the advantage of partnerships and networking in implementing asset management. Sure, Sarah. Uh, so yeah, we are a member of a 33 municipality planning district uh, in our area, and that gives us a huge opportunity to work with the communities in our local area. And uh, having this consultant come and help us, you know, work together also was very beneficial. But um, you know, even just having FCM as a partner in all of this is, makes quite a difference uh, to get this information out to the municipalities get everybody kind of thinking in the same way and and helping everyone work together and, and move up the levels. That's a great point. 33 municipalities, that's a big, uh, that's a big collaboration. <clears throat> yeah, um, it sure is. That's great. Um, uh, any of the other uh, guest speakers have any comment on value of partnerships and networking? 
Well, I would make this point, Sarah. Um, in Yukon, we're lucky enough to have a community of practice, as I think is the case in most of the uh, provinces and territories. Um, I would urge people that are not members of that community of practice to consider joining. Um, in our case, it's put on by our community affairs branch, and the people that are associated with that are also associated with FCM and serve on two uh, different groups with FCM. And, you know, as uh, I think it was Brandy said, we're into this, we're in this together. All of us are in this together, and we can learn from each other. And FCM certainly has taken the lead in trying to focus um, like our respective efforts. So think about your community of practice. That's a great point. And uh, you can find uh, respective provincial communities of practice on asset management at assetmanagementcanada.com, I believe. I believe it's .com or .ca. Um, and they're a, a nice centralized location for specific asset management communities of practice as well. Um, and you can find their websites there too. And of course, through FCM, um, we're always happy to connect connect you with anyone who can who can help or the experts. I'd I'd just like to to reinforce what what Michael said. Uh, asset management Saskatchewan uh, uh, is our community of practice group, and, and it was the, uh, the folks there are very very helpful. And the the other uh, folks that I really like to plug BC Asset Management BC was they were probably a little bit ahead of of where we were in the province, and uh, we were able to access some. So a lot of help out of their uh, uh, from Asset Management BC through their website and so on. Uh, in the last couple of years, I certainly agree. FCM has uh, provided a lot of great information, and uh, and as as asset management has become a uh, more popular uh, or a uh, uh, way of, of doing business, at least here in Western Canada, I think there's there's. Uh, a lot more collaboration between a lot of the municipalities. Sarah, I wonder if I could just make one other point uh, based on what George was saying. Um, I would strongly recommend that people have a look at uh, the Saskatchewan site because the video that those guys developed in conjunction with FCM is absolutely tremendous. And sorry, George, I've forgotten the name of your video, but perhaps you could plug it. I, you know what, Michael, I don't specifically remember, but it's, yeah, it's about an eight-minute video that's a real easy watch, and it it really uh, drives home the need uh, and, and why you should get involved with asset management. Uh, and it, it's pretty entertaining to watch, too, I believe. Uh. I agree, and I'll, I'll flip that around to everyone on the call um, so that you can have a look if you haven't seen it already. I'll, I'll send that after the after the end of the webinar today. Sure, or you can access the Asset Management Saskatchewan website, and I think there's a link to it there. Absolutely. Good point. Um, Dominique or, or Brandy, any, any additions to this uh, particular topic of discussion? Oh, no. All, all, all that what uh, – all that, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think I agree with, with everyone. If you can spoke with any, any friends, any – and anyone from another city who has already plan, uh, already uh, adopt uh, an asset management plan, do it because it will it will really give you an insight on how to do it and uh, what you have to do if you don't know anything about asset management. That's a great point. And oh, go ahead, Brandy. No, I was just going to say that I definitely agree with what everybody said. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a, a good segue into another question that we have on the line, uh, if, whether any of the panel members will be willing to share uh, your asset management policy or strategy. I know uh, one of the, the needs that seems to be coming out of the sector is, is the need for templates and, and practical tools that, uh, that can be adapted sort of regionally, um, or if you, if you know of any templates for policies or strategies or, or plans that uh, that might be a good starting point. Certainly we, uh, as a management Saskatchewan would be, and I believe there's some uh, some uh, resources available there. So uh, if, uh, if uh, if you want to send an email to Asset Management Saskatchewan, and just a sec here, I'll get the, uh, the uh, uh, 
the proper address for you here. Someone else go ahead while I'm finding the address here. I think if I had a comment, um, we're evolving in this new discipline of asset management, and I, it's probably premature, this is only my opinion, but I think it's probably premature to suspect that there's going to be an all-encompassing policy. Um, certainly what we discovered as we developed the Hange Junction situation was that different situations came up at different times that required policy advice. So uh, one of the slides I have, I know I had little uh, superscripted P's beside it, which was to show you that there were some policy considerations. Early in the day, you have to decide what the threshold is for your capital uh, assets. Are you going to use 5,000 bucks? Are you going to use 10,000, whatever? So those sort of considerations will come up at different times as you embark through the process. So it might be premature and it might be a, t a disadvantage to try and do an all-encompassing policy right off the bat. That's a great point. Get it. The uh, uh, email address for Asset Management Saskatchewan is, and these are all small case letters, info, I-N-F-O, at assetmanagementska.ca. And I'll send that. I'll send that link around, or that email address around. Sure. As well. um, and I'll also send out the Asset Management Canada link. Um, if I see uh, assetmanagement.ca doesn't work, I think it's Asset Management Canada, all one word, .ca. But I will send that around uh, after the call as well. Um, uh, a question for Shellbrook: What did you do to define levels of service and risk? Um, uh, the, the levels of service were uh, uh, we had our consultant facilitate, and it was uh, it was a an extremely uncomfortable uh, 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 event for at the start for uh, uh, for members of council. It was we we basically sat down as a council with a facilitator and and for each uh, asset, uh, and I'll, I'll use. Uh, uh, water, uh, the water system, as as an example, it's like okay, what's an acceptable level of service for your community? And it's like, uh, what do you mean? We haven't, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. So th there was a lot of discussion around that, and it, in uh, and then uh, through discussion, you realize there's there's actually uh, a differentiation between uh, th there's actually. Two levels of service. There's one for the for your customers, who, you know, what, what do they really care about? And the, the fact of the matter is, what they probably only really care about is that when you turn the tap on, you have potable water delivered. That's really what. Uh, but then for the operators of the system, there's a whole lot of different levels of service, and that would be where you would get into the, the technical things like, uh, you know, the uh, the plant operation and, and what's acceptable in terms of if you have uh, uh, something falls out, outside of the the parameters set by your uh, by your environmental folks in the province. Uh, uh, so it was it was a lot of discussion, but in the end, a lot of really good discussion, and I think it made us as council realize that we should have had that kind of information a long, long time ago because it really does spell out what's acceptable and what's not. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that answered the question. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, George. Um, maybe, maybe a segue. Oh, go ahead. No, I just wondered if I could add something to what George was saying. Um, the International Infrastructure Management Manual is probably considered to be the world authority on uh, asset management. And one of the things they point out when it comes to levels of service is that levels of service, once we get to this point, should be negotiated between the community and council. And the rationale behind that is that there's a cost associated with levels of service. So the community has to basically be on side on what they're prepared to pay for. Historically, council has made the decisions and said, this is what, you know, we're going to increase taxes to pay for this. Current philosophy is somewhat different. 
so it's worth, if you're interested in this component, just have a look at what's said in that manual. That's a good point, Michael. Thank you. And maybe a, a good segue into another question that we received of um, how everyone is engaging the public on asset management uh, based decisions, on asset management based decisions. Um, if you have any, if you have any comments on that, uh, had... I don't mind starting. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Michael. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we did is we did a presentation for our public that basically um, it, it really was how we derived the budget. So it looked at the revenue side and it also looked at the expense side. But what we did is we explained to people the importance of um, life cycle cost analysis and all these things around asset management. And honestly, at the end of the day, once people had wrapped their heads around it, they were very much in favor of what we were doing. Yeah, we, we've basically had a, a, a two or three sort of informational sessions, and the intent always was to uh, to engage our public more. Uh, we just haven't got there yet. Yeah, and I'll just say that I, I agree with George. We've intended to do a little more than we've done as well, but I agree with his earlier comment. People just want the water to come on when they turn the tap on, so they uh, are a little less concerned about some of the other things, but also agreeing with Michael that the money is very important and people really want to know where it's going. One important thing is uh, the uh, an asset management journey will give you information to better communicate with your citizens and your public. So in a way, it's, a, it's also a communication strategy when you're doing uh, this kind of thing. Uh, I think is I don't know remember the name of the city, but there's a city uh, in Ontario, I think, who have made an infographic uh, and to give that present this infographic to all this their citizen. And on this infographic, you have the cost of each infrastructure uh, of each asset, the replacement cost, uh, how much does it cost to maintain it? So in a way, it's 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 uh, it's a way to to, get, to have a discussion with your citizens on asset management and to better communicate why does it cost that much and how we can uh, and how we made our decision in asset on assets. Great point, and I, I totally agree. We had a we used a slide that's uh, on display at our in, in our office that. Uh, uh, Catalogs replacement cost of, of major assets, and it's about uh, for our the community our size, it's about ninety thousand dollars per household if we were to replace, you know, uh, uh, all of those assets. And I think it certainly brings home the, the uh, for folks the, the actual costs involved because there there's a lot of misconceptions about how inexpensive it is. The other thing I would just uh, add uh, around this whole topic is the fact that um, our, uh, our population, our, our, like our constituents, very often don't understand the mandate of council and don't necessarily understand that our mandate is to provide infrastructure. They're looking for us to spend money on a whole bunch of other things, which are not our mandate. I certainly use the opportunity to speak constituents uh, to try and mitigate um, our res like an understanding of our responsibilities. We have to look at our infrastructure first if we want to be sustainable. Anything that's a discretionary expenditure comes second. Totally agree, Michael. That's great. Thank you, everybody. Um, as an aside, Michael, could you repeat the name of the manual again? It was International Infrastructure Manual? Yeah, it's the International Infrastructure Management Manual. It's published out of uh, New Zealand and Australia. And uh, I think they're on about their fifth uh, rendition now. It's about a $400 book. Super. Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll but it is considered well. the world authority on that. Okay. And uh, I, I think John at uh, Asset Management uh, could, could uh, provide you with addresses and so on. Super. Okay, thank you. Um, on a, a bit of a different 
stream, one question that's come in, uh, what did you use to compile your asset inventory? Um, for example, asset management software or spreadsheets. Um, oftentimes, that's, that's one of the, the, the foundational steps that, that people are eager to start and get done. And uh, any insights on how you approach your asset inventories? For Placeville, we use a software to do that, but it, it, it is extremely, co not, not really costly, but it, it, you need to give a lot of time to do that, uh, a lot of human resources to, to compile all your assets to, doing, to do your inventory, and also to, the, the software was able to help you manage, manage your asset. So in a way, for, for a small city like uh, where I am, Presently at St. Ferdinand, for 2,000 people, I will not use this kind of software. It's, I, I, in my point of view, it's too costly. Uh, I will prefer to use a spreadsheet, to, uh, uh, and I think it will give you enough information to make better decisions. But I don't think I will, uh, I would, if I would have to use a software for, my, for a small city, I will not do that. I will prefer to use a spreadsheet. I'm going to totally support everything Dominic said there. Um, we developed our asset uh, registry in Excel. Depending on your personal sort of experience with Excel or your treasurer or whoever, um, you can actually develop a whole asset management software system from within Excel. And that's all we use, and it gives us all the reports that are detailed in that slide that uh, that Sarah had put up earlier. You know, replacement costs, replacement dates, even condition projection assist, uh, um, condition, asset condition uh, projections, everything. Yeah, I think we uh, uh, use the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, accounting model uh, that we were uh, that came into the province a, a number of years ago, and just refined that the data from there, uh, the uh, the TCA uh, uh, registry. In uh, in Lorburn, we did we've just used uh, Excel spreadsheets so far, but later in the year we're planning to move towards um, uh, some software, but we haven't gotten that far yet. Super. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for those insights. Maybe just to wrap up, um, as a, a, a question to everyone, um, I think we all understand there's many competing priorities in municipal government. Um, I'm hoping you could elaborate on, on ways that you or your municipality ensures that your asset management work doesn't just sit on a shelf. Um, it, it moves forward and it's self-sustaining. Um, maybe you could, you could offer some comments on on that. I know it's a struggle for many. I don't mind starting. <laughs> uh, boy, I'm mouthy today. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, it's a cultural shift. Uh, in the past, government has never worried about uh, asset management. We've always risk managed stuff, and it doesn't matter whether that has been at the federal, territorial, provincial, or municipal level. The money's always been there to replace it. The fact of the matter is that when PSAP 3150 came down, and it originally was scheduled for implementation in the 1980s, um, there was a change in culture. At some point in the future, we are going to be having to pay for the replacement of our tangible capital assets. To do that overnight would be impossible. What we're doing now is gradually laying the groundwork so that in the future we'll be in a position to do that. So it really is a cultural shift. Asset management is the basis of our sustainability as communities, and we need to recognize that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Michael. Yeah, I agree also. Me too. <laughs> I, I think uh, that uh, uh, the other thing I think is is and uh, is just keeping it in the forefront and, and incorporating it into your uh, sort of your your daily business. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you you update on an annual basis. We, we've incorporated into some of the strategies into the, uh, the strategic plan, and you revisit that two or three times a year. So. 
Uh, we talk about uh, about updating, or uh, there is a need to update levels of service, the risk assessment. So you need to keep bringing those back before council, and, and that way it maintains the uh, uh, the momentum. And I guess the last thing I would say is we certainly use it in the budgeting process. Totally, yeah. That's great. Okay, that's a that's a great note to end on, I think. Um, so as a, a, a final note, I'll just mention that you can find the Building Blocks of Asset Management Guide on FCM's website at the first link shown on this slide, and I'll, uh, I'll be able to send that around in my list of links that I'll send after this as well. Um, and you'll also be able to find many other great resources for asset management practitioner, pra <laughs> practitioners on our website as well. Um, we're also intending to post a recording of this webinar on our resource page in the following months um, after today, so you'll be able to find, uh, refer to the, the same information there as well in good time. And also, if you'd like to stay up to date about upcoming events and training opportunities offered through FCM and partners, I encourage you to, to subscribe to FCM Connect, which is our newsletter, our e-newsletter. And one final big thank you to our panelists and speakers uh, for their insights and to all of you who joined the webinar today. I, uh, I really appreciate your engagement and participation and I, uh, I wish everyone a wonderful rest of your day and week. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sarah.